resurrection, and I am life, says the Lord. Whoever has faith in me shall have life, even though he die. And everyone who has life and has committed herself to me in faith shall not die forever. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. After my awaking, he will raise me up, and in my body I shall see God. I myself shall see, and my eyes behold him who is my friend, and not a stranger. For none of us has life in himself, and none becomes her own master when she dies. For if we have life, we are alive in the Lord, and if we die, we die in the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's possession. Happy from now on are those who die in the Lord. So it is, says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God of grace and glory, we remember before you this day our brother Don. We thank you for giving him to us, his family and friends, to know and to love as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see in death the gate of eternal life, so that in quiet confidence we may continue our course on earth until, by your call, we are reunited with those who have gone before. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the first reading. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Do not stand at my grave and weep, a poem by Mary Elizabeth Fry. Do not stand at my grave, grave and weep. I am not there. I do not sleep. I am a thousand winds that blow. I am the diamond glint on the snow. I am the sunlight on ripened grain. I am the gentle autumn rain. When you wake in the morning hush, I am the swift uplifting rush of quiet birds in circling flight. I am the soft starlight at night. Do not stand at my grave and weep. I am not there. I do not sleep. Do not stand at my grave and cry. I am not there. I did not die. Big step. Um, how about those cups? <laughs> <laughs> no hitter the night before his memorial service. So isn't that appropriate? What a turnout today. It's good to see you all. Thank you for coming. Dad would have gotten a kick out of seeing you all and catching up. He loved people. He loved being with people. 
He was really the great connector. He also loved to be active and try new things. And whether he was good at those things he tried and did, or not so good, they were done with the unique Don Lyle style, often with others and without much concern about what other people thought, sometimes to our chagrin. Loving, connecting, trying, and doing, this is Dad's legacy. There are far too many stories to tell, so I'll just focus on a couple. Dad was proud of his career at the Board of Trade. Along with his Kelly Grain partners, Jim Donaldson, Dan Kelly, and Bob Adelman, he had so many trader friends and acquaintances. I run into people all the time that knew him, and this is no exaggeration. Without fail, they all say what a great guy and gentleman he was. The trading pits were cutthroat, but there was an unwritten code of honor that Dad took very seriously. One guy told me when he was just starting out, he was so green, he didn't know that corn contracts traded in multiples of five. So when he bought 10 contracts, he really had bought five times that, or 50. Way beyond what he wanted to buy and way beyond what he could afford. Dad could sense him panicking, he came over, helped him out, and he bought that position from him. The man was eternally grateful to him. Nick Zagoda, another trader, told me about the time when he thought he made a trade with Joe Ulrich, who was a protege of Dad's. Nick was writing it down on his trading card when Dad walked over to Joe and said, Joe, did I hear you offer 100? Joe replied, yes, Don, sold, and they booked the trade. Nick was outraged. Joe, you sold that to me. Without missing a beat, Joe replied, maybe, Nick, but you're not Don Lyle. <laughs> maybe the greatest thing about being a trader back then was the four-hour workday, which gave Dad a lot of time to play. Golf, Cubs games, coaching Little League, he made the most of it. He loved the mountains. We shared an A-frame in Breckenridge with our cousins. We all skied, well, except Frank. Easily the most enthusiastic of us was Dad. He was the one who was up first, herded and pushed us stubborn, whiny little kids and some of the, fam uh, some of the adults out the door and up the mountain. His enthusiasm, however, did not equate to skiing ability. <laughs> he was like a turtle on skis. <laughs> skiing with Dad was an exercise in patience. There was a lot of stopping, and you'd look back up there, and there he was, skis about 89 degree angle to the slope, <laughs> traversing back and forth the entire width of the run, <laughs> falling a lot. But he was so determined to get down that hill. We called him Mad Dog. <laughs> to be fair, the fact that he really wasn't very good at a lot of the things that he did, skiing, golf, tennis, was because he never did those things growing up. <laughs> he did those things because mom did them. And that was good enough for him. So, pardon me. He was fortunate enough to have two loves of his life both of whom he met on blind dates. His first love, Anne, he met after he moved to Chicago. <laughs> Sorry. When he got here, he lived like a typical bachelor. I picture him subsisting in a garden level apartment, bear bulb over his head, eating cereal and corned beef hash out of a can with money left over for beer. Dan's frat brother, Dan O'Neill, and his girlfriend at the time, who's now his wife, Jean, introduced Ann and Don. The courtship was fast, and Dad proposed to her within six months. Dad liked to tell about the first time he met his future father-in-law. If you knew my grandfather, Irv, he was a colossus of a man. Six foot seven, big framed, huge hands, deep voice. Irv was a successful businessman with ADM and was passing through Chicago on business. Mom brought dad out to the airport to meet him. Sizing him up, 
Irv took Dad's hand in his giant paw, and I mean it was huge, and said, nice to meet you, Dan. <laughs> but to his credit, Dad held his own, and I'm sure he earned Irv's respect. Mom and Dad were married for 27 happy years. Chapter 2. Dad was also set up on a blind date with Carol. They immediately hit it off, and as was his M.O., within six months he proposed and Carol accepted. Subject, of course, to Carol's mother's approval. <laughs> now, if you ever knew Margaret, she was the physical opposite of Irv. Maybe five foot tall, maybe 90 pounds, but regal and composed, a real lady. And hale and hearty, too. She lived until she was aged 107. In her own way, Margaret had the same intimidating presence as Irv. We may never know the true facts of that first meeting, but this much was certain. Some form of whiskey was involved before the blessing was granted. <laughs> they married in 1990 and had 29 great years together. Dad loved a great many people. His love for others may have been his highest quality. It was based on his sense of humility, which is based on the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. There was family, of course, and Mike and Susan know it takes a long time to learn the family tree. Dad's only sister, Cynthia, has seven children, 22 grandchildren, and 24 great-grandchildren. My mom had two sisters and many, many cousins. His sister, or her sister and my cousins lived down the street from us. The Robs, the Davies, and the Cahills were all living in the area. And later on, Margaret and the Prince family were made part of the family. Family occasions were really special for Dad. He always looked forward to them. And of course, he was a big socializer. On weekends, it seemed like Mom and Dad were always out with friends when we were growing up. By age 10, Jenny and I were virtually orphaned and left to fend for ourselves. <laughs> he had so many friends throughout his life, from work, the club, the neighborhood, like he collected them. Maybe that was his gift. He was the ultimate connector. The guy reaching out, whether by phone to catch up or inviting people over or out to dinner, games, golf, etc. Dad told me several times before he died, I've lived a good long life, surrounded by a wonderful family and so many great friends, and I have no regrets. I think we all want to be able to say that at the end, and that he did is testament to how well he lived his life. I'd like to close my remarks with a quote from Teddy Roosevelt's Man in the Arena speech. He kept a copy of this on his dresser. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who was actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again. Because there is no effort without error or shortcoming. Thank you. Uh, I also wanted to welcome everyone for coming today, um, either in person or um, online. Um, I know, as Matt said, that uh, da Dad really cherished his family and friends and would be so happy to know that everybody came. Um, everyone who knew Dad knew he loved a good gathering. Even Father Jason told us that every time there was a social event at the church, they knew that no matter what, Don Lyle would be there. <laughs> <laughs> Ironically, here is a gathering he would most love to attend. Because of this, though, I feel his presence here as we honor him. Uh, one person whom I know would really like to be here if she could is Dad's sister, Cynthia. Hi, Cynthia, wherever you are. <laughs> we love you and wish you could join us. 
Cynthia was kind enough to send me some great memories of dad, and I just wanted to read a summary of her first memory of dad here. It was 1934, right in the middle of the Depression, and we lived with grandparents in Detroit. One afternoon, when I was about four years old, I looked out of the third story window and saw a black sedan pull up and stop in front of the house. My dad helped my mother out of the car and she was carrying something that was all wrapped up. When she came in, I just stood there and said, I knew you'd get me one of those. <laughs> yes, I considered my brother to be my present and I cherished that present all of my life. Um, it's never easy when someone you love passes away. And as Matt said, we feel the heavy void that our dad left in our hearts every day. What I have found heartening, however, is the fact that our dad embraced life so vigorously and so graciously for so many years. And he felt grateful for all the time he had with us. And he really, as Matt said, never expressed any, any regrets. But having said this, I do remember a recent moment when dad was sick in the hospital and likely on several heavy medications. Out of nowhere, he grabbed hold of my hand and said, Jenny, I always wanted to go to Morocco. <laughs> <laughs> and there we were in the room, dark room, machines beeping away, and I thought, wow, Dad, I wish you told me earlier. <laughs> uh, otherwise, um, he was so fulfilled that it bears looking at some of the pillars by which he lived his life. He was a consummate reader, and I think I'm not exaggerating when I say that he worshipped the written word and the great literary accomplishments of authors like Thurber, Dickens, Faulkner, Hemingway, Shakespeare, Kafka, and many, many others. Even the quips of witty cartoonists, especially the ones in The New Yorker, were something he cherished. Frequently tearing out the really good ones, putting them in an envelope, and sending them to me in the mail. He typed out quotes from passages he loved and saved them in his files as words to live by. He lost his own father at a young age, and I think that in addition to the tenets of Christianity, the wise words of learned men and maybe a few women, thank you, Virginia Woolf, uh, served as his own fatherly counsel. One that I always remembered and loved is a quote attributed to Winston Churchill, someone whose courage and fortitude he admired so greatly that he wept openly when we went to the Churchill Memorial together in London. It is, quote, if you're going through hell, keep going, unquote. <laughs> I found these words inscribed on a paperweight, gave it to him, and he kept it on his desk for many years. I later learned there's no proof that Churchill actually said these words. <laughs> but this fact-checking discovery about the speaker seems less important than the fact that Churchill's character embodied them. Dad faced a lot of challenges in his life, and he bore them with poise and strength, including a painful illness he knew was making him weaker and weaker. Throughout it all, I can't help but wonder how many times words like these serve to bolster him and keep him going. It's a philosophy of persistence in the face of the worst possible circumstances and the most intense feeling of uncertainty. And if you boil it down, it's two words, keep going. Basic physics, if you stop, you freeze. If you get, keep going, it may not be pretty, but you get through it. Strong, straightforward, and loyal with a hint of good humor. <coughs> This was my dad, and I find myself remembering these words <clears throat> when I'm faced with my own challenges or when I want to remember dad with a smile. <clears throat> the other quote I found in his files, and I think it's maybe a good note to end on, is from William Faulkner upon his acceptance of the Nobel Prize in 1950. I believe that man will not merely endure, he will prevail. He is immortal, not because he alone has an inexhaustible voice, but because he has a soul a spirit capable of compassion, sacrifice, and endurance. Before I begin my homily, I want to take this opportunity to thank Father Parkin. I retired over 10 years ago, and when I announced my retirement, before people knew who my successor was going to be, they said, would you be willing to do my homily at my funeral? <laughs> and I said, 
if you ask me before I retire, and if the sitting rector, whoever he or she may be, approves, I'll come and do it. Sir, in each instance, you have given your approval. I thank you for your kindness and your generosity that enables me to come and deliver the homily for my friend, Don Lyle. Thank you very much. Don Lyle was a statuesque man, tall, dignified, strong in character, calming presence, a real gentleman. Don's father was also very tall, over six feet. Standing 31 feet tall, weighing 6,500 pounds, all aluminum, is the statue of Ceres, the Roman goddess of agriculture. And she sits on top of the old Chicago Board of Trade building. She holds a sheaf of wheat in her left hand and a bag of corn in her right. And she stands there as a testimony of what goes on in the building underneath her. For 45 years, Don went into that building and made a difference in his life, in the lives of others, and in his family. Standing tall. On one occasion, Don asked me to come and have lunch with him. He was the senior warden, the principal lay leader of the parish. So I went down to the Board of Trade. He introduced me to his associates and colleagues. And if some of you are here, I hope to meet you again afterwards. I hope you remember who I am. I may not remember who you are. <laughs> we then took a tour. And that tour ended up down in the pits that, Matt, you have very nicely described. I remember different color coats, I don't know what that meant, badges of different sizes and kinds, pens in pockets, people doing this, yelling at each other, trading. And Don took me to those pits. And I noticed that we were getting stares, grimaces, scowling, chuckles. What's Don Lyle doing bringing a priest down here in this. Does he want divine intervention for corn futures? I can't swear to this to be true. But I was told afterwards that Ceres, standing tall, actually bent over and looked down to see what was going on <laughs> down in the pits on that day. I can't swear to that, but I can swear to this. My experience was the great respect, admiration, and esteem in which Don was held by the people that worked with him and cared about him. Years later, on his 80th birthday, Don and Carol hosted a gala event at Westmoreland for family and friends. We all gathered there, trading stories about Don, some of which I won't repeat either. <laughs> when it came time for us to sit down, the people from the parish all went over to certain tables and sat together. We continued our conversations about Don, memories we had, things we admired, and as we were talking, I felt this tap on my shoulder. And I reached over and looked up, and there was Don. He bent over to me and whispered in my ear, Father, from the first time I met him to the very last time I saw him in person, he always called me Father. Not Father Myers, not Father Bob, not Bob, not Robert, always with the term Father the informal title for a priest, always. I want to apologize to you. I didn't ask you in advance. 
but would you be willing to do a blessing today before we sit down and have our meal? Don, for you, anything. I'll be back in a few minutes because they're in a big hurry. The meal's about ready to be served, so keep it short. <laughs> now, I can tell you, as a preacher, that's a blessing to us. <laughs> but people have warned me I tend to go off on into sermons during blessing times. Don came back in a few minutes, picked me up. We went up to the microphone. He asked me to stand to the side. I was in the wings, if you will. He said, I'm going to welcome people, make thanks, introduce some, and then you need to come out. Remember to keep it short. <laughs> As I was waiting, Don was preparing his cards, his notes. Somebody from the club came up to him and whispered, left. Don then came over to me and said, Father, the meal's been delayed 15 minutes. <laughs> Is there any way you can stretch this out? <laughs> Which way do you want it? <laughs> so I thought of my last sermon and thought, how could I work that in and make a big, long... Anyway, he called me up, and I made my blessing. About halfway through it, the woman that had come up to him before is coming out of the kitchen going, And so I jumped immediately to, and thank you for Don Lyle's 80 years, amen. <laughs> From that experience, like at the Board of Trade, I witnessed and experienced the respect, the admiration, and the esteem in which Don is held by his family and his friends. When Don asked me to do the homily, it's always my place, my procedure, to say to the person that asks me, what do you want said to the people of God, your family and friends, as we assemble to celebrate your life? What's important that you want said? And he thought about it, and we talked over a period of time, over and over again. He even actually sent me a letter, very thick, with instructions, biographical information, stories, and so on, and said, you can do what you want with it. He said, I have two things. First, I want you to tell the people that are assembled, I am a really blessed man. Most men are fortunate if they have one wife that they love and cherish. I have been blessed to have two. Anne for our nearly 28 years and Carol for our 29. I want you to say on that day how much I love both of them, Anne and Carol. On this day and this occasion, Don wanted to speak and say how much he loves you and how important you are in his life. And further to say to the family, to Jennifer and to Matthew, your spouses, the grandchildren, to say to them the same, how important you all are in my life. And then he added, the level of my love, I want you to use the word infinite. Godlike. That's the kind of love I have for Carol and Anne, Jennifer, Matthew, and my whole family. Be sure you say that during the time you speak. Carol, Jennifer, Matthew, and family, he loves you infinitely. The second thing he said is it would mean a lot to me if you shared with the people that are assembled my lessons of life, 
He started writing them down when he was 65. And those lessons he sent to me and he and I talked about them. He explicated some of the meaning of those lessons. The first lesson that he said I learned in life, it's very important to know who you are. It's never too early to start. It's never too late to start. The journey of life is to know who you are, not the facade that's out there, the veneer that so often we live with and behind, but to really look inside. Who am I as a person? Where is my dignity to be found? What is my contribution to the human experience? So I asked Don, how do you do that in your life? He said, I look at it as being self-mastered, learning how to master myself because I truly know who I am in the depths of my soul and the core of my being. He went on to add, the way I do that each time is I ask myself the question, who are my heroes in life? Who are the people I admire? And I thought to myself, Lincoln, Churchill, Gandhi, others. But Don added, it's not enough just to list them. One needs to ask oneself the question, why? Why do I admire Lincoln? Why do I admire Churchill? Why do I admire Gandhi? To get at the deeper meaning of what admiration is all about. And then, when I identify those characteristics, I ask myself the question, how well am I living my life to reach those ideals? Otherwise, they remain pie in the sky and have no real relevance for the life I live. First lesson is know myself, self-mastery knowing my ideals and striving to be the person I want to be. The second lesson, he said, is as that is pursued, I ask myself the question, what are the values that I want to anchor my life in and be strong about? What are my values? After 10 years, I get dry. <laughs> Don said there were two sources for his values. One is family, and the other is the church and his faith. From his family, he learned, he said, when my dad died at a young age, in his 50s, I said to my mother, I'm going to forgo college, and I'm going to work. And she said, no. I will work. You must go and pursue your college, your education. In that, Don said, I learned the importance of trust of family, networking, connecting, bringing down barriers, not letting obstacles arise between and among family members. Work to keep those bonds tight. Trust and bondedness and respect for each other. Those are values, he said, I've learned and tried to live my life. And from the church, he said, I've learned the importance of what forgiveness is all about. No human story or journey is not without its bumps and its regrets. I've learned it's important to forgive. That forgiveness helps reestablish the bond and connection and trust. And in the church, the value of the generosity of grace. I don't live a life with scarcity. There's not enough. Got to keep it close. I learned a life that there's plenty for all if we engage and share and work to make the human family a better place. And finally, the redemptive quality of love. Love conquers many things. It meets us even in death and brings us to a new place. The second 
lesson Don shared is the importance of knowing what I value and striving to live those values in the man I am. The third lesson was about education as he went off to college. And he said, it's not a diploma that's important. That's not what my life is about. It's rather I learned in college how to be a man that pursues learning all of his life. Matthew, you referenced his reading. One of my favorite books in my library was given to me by Don, 550 pages, glossy print, pictures about the French Revolution. His reading took him everywhere because he was a man that didn't want to stop learning. A current example is General Mark Milley, the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who made the statement, he was in front of Congress, and they asked him, what do you think about all those people that were in the Capitol on January 6th? They should be moved away, right? He said, well, actually, Congressman, I'm interested in finding out who they are. I want to learn from them. What leads people to behave in that way in our democracy? He went on to say, I've read Mao's a uh, little red book, the works of Marx and Lenin. It's important for me to understand and know. And I'm no communist, but I want to know what other people think and why. It broadens my horizons. It lifts my perspective. That's the lesson that Don knows, a life that's continually learning and growing. Another lesson. Don wanted to be shared, is the importance of having a challenging vocation. Often we talk about that as a challenging job, or challenging work, or a challenging career. As Don and I discussed it, vocation is different. Work and career are what we do. Vocation is what I become. In the priesthood, we talk about the calling of God, the vocation of ordination. It's to become something different. And Don shared that in his lesson in life, it's learning to have a challenging vocation, to challenge us to be more than we would otherwise be. His fifth lesson was engaging in politics. Don loved to be politi politically active, the polis, the city, citizenship. And he said, the point of having a strong political involvement is that every generation, our republic, our democracy, our constitution is passed and successfully passed, lest it be dropped. Don talked about Franklin saying, it's a great thing, that constitutional republic, as long as they can keep it. So to Don, this lesson in life was one of politics is about learning that it's not my good, what's good for me, my family's good. Politics raises our horizons by asking the question, is it in the common good? Because ultimately, if it's not in the common good, ultimately it won't be good. And finally, his last lesson was moderation. He started with Socrates. A life unexamined is not worth living. And he ends with Aristotle, the golden mean, moderation. And a deep reading of Aristotle tells us that it's a moral issue that Aristotle is driving at. It's not a diet plan, eat in moderation. It's far more profound. How do we live our lives moderately? Extremes on either side bring us lower. Aristotle appeals to the middle. I can be a glutton or I can starve to death. Extremes pull away from moderation. Politically, 
rebellious anarchy pulls us away from moderation. Religiously, fanaticism or giving the enterprise up and dismissing it, moderation. Don's messages and lessons are timely at this point in our history, as they're always timely with a man with this kind of wisdom. We thank him for sharing the second purpose of my remarks. Today, at this very moment, down there on LaSalle Street in Chicago, 45 stories up is Ceres, the Roman goddess of agriculture, reminding those that walk by the importance in the human experiment, human civilization, of what agriculture does. It feeds. Tonight, when it's dark outside, they'll put lights on to shine upon her so people can still see. You and I know the world can be a dark and cold place. And that's what family and this holy place are about, responding to that dark and cold world with the warmth of family, the love of family, and the light of family. Series, LaSalle Street. Kenilworth Avenue in this village. We're assembled beholding the statuesque stature of Don Lyle, who stands much taller than 31 feet. And when it gets dark tonight, We don't need illumination from the outside to him. Each of us will carry part of him and the light of his life in our own hearts. And this place is dedicated to the one who came among us and said, I am the light of the world. To come to illumine a different way of being as human beings. We celebrate the life of a Christian gentleman who did just that. And we commit his soul to that infinite light. May he rest in peace. Amen. singing hymn 382 rather than 381 as it is listed in the bulletin. Please stand. <laughs>
Let us pray. For our brother Don, let us pray to our Lord Jesus Christ who said, I am resurrection and I am life. Lord, you consoled Martha and Mary in their distress. Draw near to us who mourn for Don and dry the tears of those who weep. Hear us, us, Lord. You wept at the grave of Lazarus, your friend. Comfort us in our sorrow. Hear us, Lord. You raise the dead to life. Give to our brother eternal life. Hear us, Lord. You promised paradise to the thief who repented. Bring our brother to the joys of heaven. Hear us, Lord. Don was washed in baptism and anointed with the Holy Spirit. Give him fellowship with all your saints. Hear us, Lord. He was nourished with your body and blood. Grant him a place at the table in your heavenly kingdom. Hear us, Lord. Comfort us in our sorrows at the death of our brother. Let our faith be our consolation and eternal life our hope. Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to you our brother Don, who was reborn by water and the Spirit in holy baptism. Grant that his death may recall to us your victory over death, and be an occasion for us to renew our trust in your Father's love. Give us, we pray, the faith to follow where you have led the way, and where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, to the ages of ages. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please exchange a sign of God's love with one another. Before we continue with the commendation on page eight, we'd like to make sure that everyone knows that all are invited to continue the celebration of Don's life at a reception at Westmoreland, the address for which is in the back of the bulletin. Also wanted to let you know that if you would care to join us for the interment immediately following the service, please follow the family and the altar party as we go out to the cloister column frame right out here to your right. Also, the bulletin includes information about memorial gifts and designations if you would like to make a gift in Don's memory. There are two organizations dear to his heart that are included in the uh, bulletin itself. On a personal note, I just wanted to mention that although Father Myers didn't include this fact, um, Don was the senior warden who called him to be the rector in 1986. A year later, Father Myers was looking for a senior associate, a new position he wished to fill, and somehow got my name. And so I interviewed first with Bob, and then in the third grade church school classroom, sitting in small chairs with Don Lyle and Earl Frederick, who is here today. The three of us sitting in those tiny chairs. So Don and Earl were the very first two parishioners I ever met uh, who also had a hand in my coming here first as associate rector and then eventually succeeding my dear friend and mentor 10 years ago. So that's full circle for all of us on this day when we give thanks for a man of such wonder and beauty and joy. And now please, on page eight, join us in the commendation Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with your saints, where, where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sighing but life everlasting. You only are immortal, 
the creator and maker of humankind, and we are mortal, formed of the earth, and to earth shall we return. For so did you ordain when you created me, saying, You are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust, yet even at the grave we make our song, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant and your saints, where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sign but life everlasting. Into your hands, a merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Don. Acknowledge we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a child of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. Amen. And the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. And now, please join in our final hymn. 